bunches on the hillside. Little bunches made a dicky daddy and an old maid. Now the dicky daddy and an old maid. You're it. Ha! <laughs> You're everything that's going on. In other words, you are a particular place at which the whole universe is focused. With that in mind, we can go on now to the question of pain and our so-called reactions to it. And once again, you will see that the problem as posed immediately sets up the duality of the pain and the one who suffers it. <laughs> the one who offers resistance. And therefore, reasoning from that, you can quite easily see that a great deal of the energy of pain is derived from the resistance offered to it. And that resistance takes very many forms, not only of attempts to get away from a pain which is present. Let's suppose you tried to run away from a migraine headache. As you carry it with you, you can't get away from it, and it seems to be absolutely in the middle of everything that you are. So that however much you thresh and resist, the pain goes with the threshing. Other forms of pain are problematic to a large extent because of our prior anxiety about them. and because of the valuations that we put on them. So we have a big, big social problem, fundamental, right from the beginning, about our reaction to anything painful. And these are very odd things. Let's take, for example, when a child has eaten something that doesn't agree with it and it vomits. Now, you well know that when you've got a bad stomach, that vomiting is a very pleasant release from that. But because when mama sees the vomit, or somebody else does, they say, ugh, you are taught that doing it is socially unacceptable, and therefore people suppress vomiting. and learn from their parents that it's nasty, just as they learn that excrement is nasty, and just as they learn to worry about disease and death. Now, there really isn't anything radically wrong with being sick or with dying. Who said you're supposed to survive? Who gave you the idea that it's a gas to go on and on and on? <laughs> and we can't say that it's a good thing for everything to go on living from the very simple demonstration that if we enable everybody to go on living, we overcrowd ourselves. That we're like an unpruned tree. And so, therefore, uh, one person who dies, in a way, is honorable because he's making room for others. And the panic that all life everywhere must be saved, although each one of us individually will naturally appreciate it when anybody saves our life, if we apply that case, you see, all around, we can see that it's not workable. We can also look further into it and see that if our death could be indefinitely postponed, 
we would not actually go on postponing it indefinitely. Because after a certain point, we would realize that that isn't the way in which we wanted to survive. Why else would we have children? Because children arrange for us to survive in another way. By, as it were, passing on a torch so that you don't have to carry it all the time. There comes a point where you can give it up and say, now you work. It's a far more amusing arrangement for nature to continue the process of life through different individuals than it is always with the same individual. Because as each new individual approaches life, life is renewed. And one remembers how fascinating the most ordinary everyday things are to a child. Because they see them all as marvelous, because they see them all in a way that is not related to survival and profit. And when we get to thinking of everything in terms of survival and profit value, as we do, then the shapes of scratches on the floor cease to have magic. And most things, in fact, cease to have magic. So therefore, in the course of nature, once we have ceased to see magic in the world anymore, we are no longer fulfilling nature's game of being aware of itself. There's no point in it anymore. And so we die. And so something else comes to birth, which gets an entirely new view. And so nature's self-awareness is a game worth the candle. It is not, therefore, natural for us to wish to prolong life indefinitely. But we live in a culture where it has been rubbed into us in every conceivable way that to die is a terrible thing. And that is a tremendous disease from which our culture in particular suffers. And we notice it firstly in the way in which death is swept under the carpet. And you say, who's in charge around here? Well, nobody's in charge. There never was anybody in charge.